I found an old cassette tape in an abandoned mental institution. I never should have listened to it. By Carl B. 1961. Me and my friends, Jordan, Ashley, and Sam, are urban explorers in our free time. You're probably familiar with the type of stuff we do, but in case you're not, we go around exploring abandoned locations, record it on our phones, and upload the videos on YouTube. Old abandoned warehouses, amusement parks, industrial complexes, you name it, we've done it. It's a fun hobby, but it can be scary, not to mention dangerous. Some of the places we've explored are condemned structures so dilapidated, they look like a strong wind would knock them down. You have to be careful navigating those places, and constantly stop to inspect your surroundings. You never know when a rotted stairway might give way under your feet, or a rusted catwalk might collapse and send you plunging 50 feet into a hard concrete floor. Not to mention, there's always the possibility of running to some strung out drug addict or crazy homeless person squatting there. Plus, what we do isn't exactly legal. We've had some close calls. Once a security guard chased us out of a deserted factory, and another time, someone actually called the police on us. Luckily, the guy wasn't too much of a hard ass and let us off with a warning. You probably think we're stupid or crazy to do what we do. And maybe you're right, but that's just the way we are. We enjoy the thrill of it. Two weeks ago, Sam got a tip on a new place that seemed like primo material for our next video. Especially with Halloween approaching. An old, crumbling mental hospital in the next county had been built in the late 1800s and had been abandoned for 30 years or so. The early 90s, I believe, and had a pretty sordid past. Supposedly, it was shut down after some kind of scandal involving an investigative reporter who went undercover as a patient and uncovered all kinds of abuse and neglect on the part of the staff. There were even rumors that the doctors were conducting all kinds of messed up secret experiments on the patients. None of that is substantiated, of course. It's just a typical bullcrap urban legend that spring up around a place like that. The official story is the hospital was closed due to government cutting their funding for budget reasons. According to Sam, the place was scheduled to be demolished soon in order to put up an apartment complex. So this was probably our only chance to check it out. So, last weekend the four of us hopped into Jordan's old Mazda and made the two hour drive out there. The institution was located in a relatively rural area on the outskirts of the city. As soon as it came into view, we knew we wouldn't be disappointed. A forbidding gray stone building, four stories tall with narrow barred windows, stood in the middle of a sprawling, heavily overgrown lawn behind a high, rusted chain-link fence with razor wire coiled over the top. The main gate was adorned with a faded no trespassing sign, marked with a couple of .22 bullet holes, and secured with a thick chain and heavy padlock. But after a few minutes of poking around, Ashley found a place in the fence where some intrepid explorer before us had snipped a decent sized hole through the chain link, probably with a bolt cutter. We slipped through it easily and made our way up the long, overgrown driveway towards the main building. The closer we got, the more creeped out I started to feel. The immense stone building seemed to loom over us, its imposing facade almost resembling a scowling face with many narrow, barred eyes that stared coldly down at four intruders approaching it. The main entrance doors had been nailed shut at one point, but someone, presumably the same person who had cut a hole in the fence, had pried off the sheet of plywood that had once covered them, and they stood wide open, like a gaping mouth of a beast getting ready to swallow its prey whole. We paused for a couple minutes, still about 20 yards away, so that Sam could film Jordan standing in front of the institution as he did a brief intro. Then we closed the remaining distance, all of us with our phone cameras on and recording, and entered the decrepit building. We were in the main lobby area. The floor was littered with all kinds of debris and trash, dead leaves that had blown in through the open doors, empty beer cans, fast food wrappers, cigarette butts, you name it. Presumably stuff that had been left over by kids using this building as a hangout spot, and homeless people looking for a place to get drunk and crash for the night. The walls were marked with graffiti, a bedpan, one of those old-school steel ones stood on the reception desk. None of us dared approach it for a closer inspection. We looked around for a while, and eventually found the main stairway, standing next to the long, dead elevators. We went upstairs to explore the second story, with the hospital's administrative wing. Offices, mostly. Honestly, there wasn't much interesting in most of them. The place had been pretty thoroughly cleared out when the institution was shut down, and all that remained were some empty filing cabinets and discarded pieces of ancient office equipment. In the hospital's director's office, a cardboard shoebox stood open on the otherwise bare desk. I peered inside and saw it contained a number of old audio cassette tapes. 
still in various cases. I flipped through them, out of curiosity. There were a dozen of them. They had various names and dates carefully printed on the labels. I didn't know what they were, but Sam suggested that maybe they were recordings of therapy sessions from former patients. I grabbed one at random and threw it in my pocket to take back with me, just as a souvenir. Then we continued our investigation, filling anything we found that looked even remotely interesting. Truthfully, the whole trip was kind of a letdown. There wasn't much to see or film. The top two floors were patient rooms, but they were almost all vacant except for a couple of rusted bed frames, more litter, and the occasional graffiti artist tag. The place didn't even have a particularly sinister or creepy ambience once you were inside. There were no operating tables spattered with dried blood or rusted surgical implements. Not even a spooky abandoned wheelchair standing in one of the corridors. The institution had been minimum security when it had been in operation, so it wasn't like there had been any especially violent or dangerous patients kept locked up there. In other words, there was no dungeon ward in the basement where the likes of Hannibal Lecter had been imprisoned safely away from the general population. It could have been an abandoned office building for the, all the atmosphere it generated. After about an hour, we decided to call it quits. Jordan filmed an outro and apologized to the audience for the video being such a disappointment. Then we left to go back to our car and drove home without incident. I went on with my normal routine and had pretty much forgotten all about our exploration at the mental hospital. Until Wednesday morning, when I was getting ready to leave for work. I couldn't find my car keys, which I typically carried in my pants, and was desperately hunting my apartment for them in a rush to not be late. I searched for them in my jacket pocket, not finding them, but instead the cassette tape I had swiped from the institution. I had completely forgotten all about it. I had other priorities at the moment, so I just tossed it on my desk for the time being and went on with my search. I eventually located my keys. They had slipped out of my pants and found their way under the cushions of my couch. I got to work only a couple of minutes late. That evening when I got home, I spotted the cassette on my desk and after dinner decided to give it a closer inspection. It was one of those 90 minute jobs that fit into a full size portable tape recorder. Carefully printed on the label by hand in faded black ink were the words Bennett Michael and a date. 8 17 91. Intrigued, I went into the garage and dug around until I found my dad's old recorder. I popped in some new batteries, then inserted the cassette. I wasn't sure if either the recorder or the tape would still function after all this time, but figured it was worth a try. I plugged a pair of earbuds into the recorder, put them on, then pressed the play button. For a few seconds there was only a hissing sound. Then a dry clinical man's voice spoke in a professional monotone. The audio quality was still surprisingly clear and only slightly degraded even after 30 years. Patient 67531. Bennett S. Michael, session number 7, session being conducted by Dr. Eugene Winters at 2 p.m. on August 17, 1991. There were a few seconds of hissing silence, then the audio resumed. At first, the only sound was a man's heavily, slightly uneven breathing. Then the professional, clinical voice from before, the doctor, spoke. How are you feeling today, Michael? The ragged breathing continued. There was no answer. Michael? A second voice spoke. It sounded like it belonged to a younger man. The voice was agitated and tight with suppressed emotion. The voice of a man in turmoil struggling to maintain his composure. What the fuck do you care how I feel? What does it matter anyway? There's nothing you can do. All you do is ask me the same goddamn question over and over again. Every single time! The emotion behind those words could have been rage or something else. It's an integral part of your therapy, Michael. You have to get to the root of whatever is the source for your mental distress in order to give you the necessary treatment you require so that you can function normally again and return to society. Bullshit! The man interrupted with a shout. You're just playing with my fucking head like all the other shrinks did. To you, I'm just another freak you can play your little mind games on. Some nut you can exploit to get published in all the big shot medical journals. The doctor spoke softly. I'm only trying to help you, Michael. A contemptuous snort. There's nothing you can do to help me, Doc. There's nothing anyone can do. There was anger in the voice, but something else, too. Fear. Please, Michael, you have to work with me if you want to get out of here. You refuse to tell the other doctors what you're so afraid of. What causes you to wake up in the middle of the night screaming? Why don't you tell me, Michael? Tell me what you've been so scared of all these years. Several so moments of silence, then the man spoke. All the rage was gone from his voice, but the fear remained. He spoke with defeated resignation. Fine, I'll tell you, just so I can tell someone and finally get it out. You'll think I'm crazy, but everyone already does. 
That's why I'm in this loony bin. Why the fuck not? He chuckled humorously. He took a few seconds to gather himself before he began. Do you know what it's like to live your whole life knowing the worst thing you could ever know, Doctor? The worst thing anyone could ever know? Do you know what it's like to live every single moment in pure terror? Terror? Of what, Michael? What if I could see things that other people couldn't? Things that people weren't meant to see? No things humans weren't meant to know. I can see these things, Doctor. It started when I was eight or nine. That's when I first began seeing them. Them? The doctor asked. The forgotten ones. That's what I call them. They call themselves the ancient ones, or the originals. What are they, Michael? These forgotten ones. People talk about hauntings, about seeing ghosts. You hear about it all the time. Some people even claim to be able to communicate with them, channel them for a living. Spiritual controllers, psychics, whatever you want to call them. Most of them are full of bullshit, frauds, but maybe a few of them are the real thing. The psychics deal with the dead people, human ghosts. The man paused and let out a shaky sigh. If it was the ghost of people, I might be able to cope with that. Maybe I could have gotten used to it and come to accept it, but... But the Forgotten Ones are not human, and they never were. Go on, Michael. I'm listening, the doctor urged him. They're old. Very, very old. They died long before mankind ever existed on Earth. But before they died, they lived here for a long, long time. The planet is billions of years old, Doc, and human beings have only been around for a couple million. Do you honestly think ours was the first civilization to ever exist? That no one was before us? They were the original rulers of Earth. They have been dead for hundreds of millions of years long before even the dinosaurs came along. But their spirits are still here. They always have been invisible to us, watching us. There is no afterlife, you see. No heaven, no hell. When you die, your spirit is just stuck here forever. The Forgotten Ones saw the human race evolve. They saw our civilization rise, and they hate us. They always hated us. They see us as intruders, invaders, thieves, who took the world that was once theirs for ourselves. I see, the doctor interjected patronizingly. Yeah, sure you do, the man muttered clinically. What do these Forgotten Ones look like, Michael? You don't want to know, the man replied in a strained, trembling voice. They're monsters beyond description, and so full of rage and envy and vengeance. I know all of this because they tell me. They communicate to you? The doctor asked. Oh yes, all the time. They know I can see them. I can't understand what they're saying when I'm awake. They speak in their own language, but when I'm asleep, they come into my dreams, and then I can understand. The Forgotten Ones hate us, but they can't harm us. They can't touch us because they're ghosts and we're alive. We're safe from them, as long as we're alive. But when we die, when our spirits separate from our mortal bodies and we cross over into their realm, then it's payback time. There was a long pause. The doctor said nothing to break the silence. The man resumed. Whoever came up with a notion of hell, of demons, of tortured souls, and an eternal damnation, maybe they caught a glimpse of what the Forgotten Ones do to the spirits of the dead. That was where the recording ended. The audio cut off and a hissing silence resumed. I listened for a couple more minutes, but there was nothing else. Then I turned off the recorder, ejected the cassette tape, and just sat staring at it for a long time, disturbed by what I had just listened to. Out of curiosity, I entered Michael S. Bennett in the name of the mental hospital into Google and did a search. I found an obituary in the local newspaper from Michael Samuel Bennett. He had died on November 11, 1994, at the age of 31. But it didn't say how. I did a bit more digging and found a newspaper article about his death. He had died alone in his apartment of liver failure after a long struggle with alcohol addiction. There was a picture of a man with a gaunt face and dark haunted eyes. I couldn't find anything to suggest that he had a history of mental health issues or had ever been a patient of the institution. Maybe his family had wanted to keep that out of the paper. Or maybe the hospital records had been kept confidential. Maybe it wasn't even the same guy. The things that the guy said on the tape still creeped me out. 
He sounded so convinced and so sincere about this thing. He claimed to be able to see. I tell myself I'm making a big deal out of nothing. That what I had heard had been nothing but the rambling, paranoid delusions of an extremely disturbed mental patient. And that's all it is, right? That's all it can be. Right? 